Sweet potato souffle is really the dessert, but it's served along with the meal. I like to have a little sweet and salty on the same plate, and this sweet potato souffle is perfect. You've been making sweet potato souffle for several years. Yeah, I started it when the kids were little, I think trying to get them to eat vegetables, and of course it's got a lot of sugar and other stuff in it, but once they know they like sweet potatoes, then you can try them other ways. True. But this one with the nuts on top, it's, it's just different from the old marshmallow one that everybody used to make. Yeah, and the sweet potato casserole from our childhood is covered with marshmallows, and I don't know, it just never was really my favorite. There's so much food on the table anyway, so we're kind of sneaking dessert in with the meal, so you can right. just put it on the plate. Our sweet potatoes have cooled enough to handle, and I'm just gonna break them up a little bit before I put the rest of my stuff in there. And you're making the topping. Right, I'm chopping a cup of nuts, pecans, of course. So I'm gonna get the eggs and the milk. Okay, and I'm going to add a cup of brown sugar, pack it in the cup kind of tight. I'm putting two eggs in here. Okay. I'm ready to eat. So a couple of eggs, cup of sugar. I'm stirring in my half cup of flour with the nuts and the brown sugar. You're so helpful. I thank you. And then I'm going to take a half of your stick of butter. Can I have that? You can. I have about a teaspoon and a half of vanilla going in. Maybe a little more. A little Give salt, a little pepper. Butter for you. And really is truly a souffle. It really does whip up into a really light sweet potato mm -hmm. souffle. And then this topping is this awesome pecans and brown sugar. Yeah. And it's just really, really awesome. Get that started. Then I'm gonna get this whipped and then I'm gonna add my butter. About a half a cup. Just to kind of get it started so it doesn't fly all over the kitchen. Although I have been known to have flying souffle. So your kids like the sweet potatoes. They souffle. do like it. And they, like I said, they've learned to like sweet potatoes just in general from, from having this. Because they like the cans, they love sugar. Yeah. Who doesn't love sugar? Who doesn't love sugar? Okay. It's about ready. Awesome. Let's get our dish ready. The last thing we're gonna add is about a half a cup of milk. Together. I like this on the plate with all the salty stuff because I really like salt, but I yeah. love to have this taste of sweet and then I can go right back in with the yeah, salt. Yeah, and it looks good on the plate too. You know, the other thing about that, the other recipe that people used to make with marshmallows is by the time you get it to the table, especially if you take it somewhere, the marshmallows are kind of eh. And this eh. is just still very good <laughs> yeah. even later. I have a friend who actually asks me to make sweet potatoes to play for her birthday cake. Really? Yes. <laughs> so in lieu of birthday mm -hmm. cake, you know she, that's good. she gets sweet potato soup. Okay, ready cool. for topping? Yep. Okay. I'll help you. Help me. And this just gets crunchy and sweeter and sweeter and as it cooks. And this is really also good the next day. It is good on dinner. <laughs> They'll be ready to eat. Okay. okay. 350 for about 30, 40 minutes, you mm -hmm. think? I think so. Okay. Very chic, very good. Pecans, brown sugar, it rocks. Today I'm doing a pulled pork barbecue with a twist on my dad's vinegar-based sauce. So I'm gonna start with the sauce for this barbecue. So the first thing I gotta do is puree about a cup of onions. And to puree onions, you just needed to add a little bit of water. About a fourth of a cup of water. There. Basically liquefying the onions. And then we're gonna cook these down. I'm gonna just saute these on the top of the stove until I cook out most of this water. There's a couple of cups of apple cider vinegar. And then he always put tomato juice in his instead of tomatoes in the sauce. About six ounces. You just eyeball it. A little dash of pepper in here. A little dash of cayenne and a dash. Because I also put a little hot sauce in here. So I do the double whammy on the hot stuff. So if you do more than a dash, you could end up needing a gallon of water handy. <laughs> and then about a teaspoon of garlic powder. And I'll let that come to a boil. The cool thing is that it's a slow cooker pork. Once you get the pork rubbed and you get your onions in the pot, you just put it back on your slow cooker and it cooks for 10 to 12 hours. So I'm just gonna quarter two medium-sized sweet onions and they'll just go in the bottom of the slow cooker. And then we're gonna do a really simple rub for the Boston butt. So it's just a couple teaspoons of light brown sugar, a couple of teaspoons of salt, pinch of pepper, and I use about a teaspoon of the smoked paprika. And this is really cool. It gives it a really nice smoky flavor. 
this is a five pound Boston butt, which is basically a pork shoulder. Pork shoulder is really good to use because you can't overcook it. And the great thing about pulled pork is you really do want it to fall off the bone. So this is a bone in Boston butt. So here's a little rub that I did earlier, and you wanna just try to get it into all the little nooks and crannies that you can. You can really work this into the meat, and then you don't have red paprika hands for the rest of the day. So that looks good to me, it looks completely covered. So now I'm gonna just stick this on the top of the onions in here. And voila, we're not even dirty. The sauce is boiling, which is what you want, so it's done. I'm gonna put a teaspoon of sugar in here, but you wanna do that after you've turned off the heat. And then we're gonna take a cup of this sauce and pour it over the pork. And then you can just let the rest of this cool and save it for extra sauce. I'm gonna pour a cup of this over, and then we're just gonna put this on the slow cooker. I'm gonna set it for 10 hours, and I'm gonna check it and see what it's looking like after that. It's the moment of truth, you know, when you open the lid to the slow cooker and you pull that pork out, and if it falls off the bone and falls back into the pot, you're like, this is really good. What I do, when it's this tender, you just kind of take the fork and just kind of start piecing it apart. I save some of the juice from the slow cooker for the pork, and so I'm just gonna pour a little extra on here just to keep it really nice and moist. This is gonna make a really great pulled pork sandwich with that nice little vinegary sweet taste. My unfried chicken is moist from the buttermilk that you use. It's still got the crunch with breadcrumbs, and I add a little twist for more flavor, hot sauce. You're gonna wanna watch this, this is good. Yeah, I was smelling it, I can't wait to see it. <laughs> I'm salting and peppering my chicken for unfried chicken. This is gonna be so, so good. Fried chicken is a staple in the South and you gotta have it, but you know, it's not the healthiest thing. So there are a lot of easy ways to make a fried taste of chicken without actually frying the chicken. And that's what we're gonna do today. I've got four thinly sliced chicken breasts that are boneless and skinless. I'm using buttermilk, which is actually lower in fat than regular milk. Did you know that? So I'm using about a cup of buttermilk. Ah, oh, I love fried chicken. And hot sauce. When you're trying to lose weight, one of the things you don't want to give up is flavor, and spices are your friend. So I like heat, heat tastes good to me, and so I'm gonna put a little bit of hot sauce in this, about a tablespoon of hot sauce. And there's also gonna be a little bit of heat in the crumbs. <laughs> this is really hard to get out. <laughs> so that might be a little more than a tablespoon of hot sauce, but I love me some hot sauce. If I was gonna fry this chicken in oil, I would still wanna put it in a soak. I would still do this before. So we're just really eliminating the frying part and a little bit of healthier twist on the breading. I'm gonna mix that together, and then I'm just gonna put my chicken in here and let it soak while I'm getting my crust prepared. So I'm just gonna let this soak while I get the dry ingredients going, and this is just gonna be my breading, and I'm gonna use panko breadcrumbs. These are multi-grain, I'm gonna use about a cup and a half, and they're Japanese breadcrumbs, and what's nice about them is that they're a little bit lighter than regular breadcrumbs, and they're gonna give it a really nice crunch. And then, of course, you know, multigrain is always good. I'm adding about three tablespoons of Parmesan cheese, and that's really the key, is flavor. I like the pungent flavor of Parmesan, and I put it in as many dishes as I possibly can. And then crushed red pepper is one of my favorite spices. I use it a lot, just to dress up really any dish to give that little kick and it makes the dish taste better. So I'm gonna put it in the breadcrumbs. I'm gonna add about a teaspoon of crushed red pepper. And then lemon. I'm just gonna put some lemon zest in here. It's just, again, gonna add a lot of flavor. I'm gonna put the zest of all of this lemon in here and it's gonna be about a tablespoon probably. So I'm just gonna mix this up. Actually, you can mix this up by hand. I'm gonna add a little bit of salt and pepper. And then I'm gonna dredge my chicken pieces in it. Okay, chicken going in. If you love fried chicken, try this. It's not one of those things where people are gonna say, oh, you made this really healthy. I don't want people to say, oh, this is really light, this is really good for you. I want people to say, this tastes good. I might have to take this chicken to the next church social and shock and amaze all my friends who are eating fried chicken. Don't those look good? And they're gonna be nice and light and crunchy. My unfried chicken is ready to go in the oven. The breadcrumbs have had a chance to really stick to the chicken. 400 degrees for about 25 minutes. I'm ready, I'm ready. I love a side dish. I'm just gonna put a little bit of lemon juice on this. That's, that's terrific. See, I'm already being very southern. I'm mixing my, I'm mixing my mash with my chicken. 
chicken is delicious. So good. I'm gonna start with sage sausage, about a pound of sausage. This is a casserole. Everybody in the South has a breakfast casserole. You could put bacon in there if you want. Really, it's up to you. About a half a loaf of just plain regular white bread. And this is one of those cases where if your bread is a little bit older, like it's not just super, super fresh, it'll slice a lot easier. And I'm just gonna cube this bread up. So I'm putting this all in a big nine by 13 pan that I have sprayed with cooking spray. And this is gonna be the bottom layer of the casserole. See how easy? So then you're just gonna press this in the bottom of the pan, like so. Done. Keep cooking your sausage meanwhile, just breaking it up. And you just really wanna cook the sausage until it's completely done. You don't want any pink in the sausage. Gotta have eggs. Five large eggs just whisked together. And I'm making this ahead of time because it is something that you should chill in the refrigerator. And if I was making this actually for breakfast, I would make this the night before and put it in the fridge overnight for about eight hours. So this is the first thing, and then I'm just gonna stick this in the fridge and let it chill for as long as it can before we bake it later. I'm gonna add some half and half to that and some salt and some dry yellow mustard. So I get my half and half out of the fridge, cheese, when I grate cheese, I just grate a bunch of cheese. And I'm gonna use all this today, but not all of this in this recipe. About two cups of half and half, and you can measure this exactly or you can eyeball it. I make this casserole so much that I just eyeball it. That's about two cups. Nice and creamy. A pinch of salt. There's gonna be a good amount of salt in the sausage, so you don't need to over salt. And dry yellow mustard. Now this is what my dad used to always put in this casserole. It adds a little bit of a tang, but I have made this before and either forgot the mustard or didn't have any, and it doesn't make that much difference. So if you don't have it, don't worry about it. Not a big deal. Whisk all that together. Oh, the sausage smells so good and it's ready. Fully cooked. Donna's gonna be so excited that we're having this. You can slot out any extra grease that might be in the sausage, and we're just gonna add that on top of this layer. My dad used to always make this and have grits on the side. That's a very Southern thing. I won't make Donna eat grits today. She's an oaky. I don't think she could handle it. About 10 ounces of grated cheddar cheese. It's about half this bag. I, I grated extra today because we're gonna use some later when Donna and I make hash brown casserole. Yeah, two casseroles, it's happening. Put about half this cheese on the top. And the egg mixture. You just pour this over the top. As it bakes, the eggs sort of rise up around the rest of the ingredients and really just make it fluffy and pretty. This is basically gonna turn into like fancy redneck quiche. It's gonna be really, really good. All you do is cover it with foil and put it in the fridge for eight hours or overnight if you're gonna actually eat it for breakfast, which we're not. We're gonna eat it for dinner. I was busy this morning while you were sleeping in. <laughs> she, yeah, okay. I was making breakfast sausage casserole. I'll give you a little tiny piece at it. Oh, it's been, that looks great. It's been sitting for several hours. And if you did this for really for breakfast, you would make this the night before and let it sit in your fridge overnight. So then in the morning, you just pop it in the oven and you got breakfast. Pretty fantastic. This is the breakfast sausage casserole. Would you like to reveal how beautiful it is? I would love to reveal it how beautiful. Oh, it looks good. It has to sit for about 15 minutes just to let everything kind of gel together and cool off enough so that you can actually eat it. It really is a good hearty supper. It's got sausage and cheese and eggs and bread. Donna's gonna love it. For the perfect poolside snack, I am making my chunky avocado salsa. A little bit of pineapple gives it a real tropical flair. I mean, this might be the best salsa on the planet. I'm just saying. So this is really a combination of guacamole and salsa, all the good things in one, and avocado gets to be the star, and the tomatoes just get to be the sidekick in this dish. I'm just dicing up three avocados. Garth makes guacamole, and he makes it very smooth, which I like, but I like the chunky, so that's what I'm doing. And I'm gonna add some of that awesome pineapple, some cilantro, some tomatoes, some lime juice, and an onion and some spices. You know, when you eat this, if you can't go on a vacation like I can't today, um, then you just make it at home and it kind of feels like you're at the beach. 
My friend Julie is coming over today and I don't get to see her very often and she never takes a vacation. So the fact that she's actually coming here is as close to a vacation as I think she's gonna get. So we're just gonna have fun. We're just gonna hang out and be decadent. You put about a quarter of an onion in here and I might go ahead and put a half because that's a good stack of avocado there. The cool thing about this recipe is that it calls for a certain number of things, but you can kind of eyeball what you like best. So I'm just gonna cut up this onion, kind of a small dice. Because I like onion, but I don't like huge chunks of onion in my salsa. And I'm making this thing. It's my staycation. I'm going to make it how I like it. And then just a small dice. I like grape tomatoes in this, but not just a quarter of that. Just going to do 10 or 12 of these. I think they're sweet, a little bit sweeter than the big tomato. Vacation food is just a different kind of comfort food. You know, certain foods will take you back to some memory, and it's really like taking you right back to the beach. I can feel my toes in the sand. I can hear that breeze coming off the ocean. Scoop these up and put them in. It's also really a pretty dish, all the bright colors together. It's festive. It's vacation-y. OK, here's the pineapple. This pineapple I had in Hawaii, oh my goodness, changed my life. About a half a cup of pineapple. So I'm just going to slice nice chunks. Cilantro, very vacation-y. About an eighth of a cup. So just going to take off a little bit of that. I'm going to add a little bit of lime juice to this because it really brings the flavors to life and it keeps the avocados fresh. You just want to roll it a little bit to get the juices moving in there. Use my handy dandy little juicer. And this is really a to taste thing, but I love the flavor of lime juice. And I like a little heat, so I am adding some crushed red pepper and then about a quarter of a teaspoon of garlic salt and just a dash of pepper. And then we mix it up and we taste it to make sure that it's good. See, look at all those colors together. It's so pretty. Right, let's give this a taste. A little bit of everything. Get a little tomato on there, get a little avocado on there, a little onion. Mm-hmm. Mm Perfect amount of lime juice. Very citrusy.